Okay, now we're ready to start. <laughs> I'm very happy to introduce Daryl Ray. Thank you, gosh. A lot of people were loving me last night. People I don't even know were loving me last night. And I had only one drink, only one drink. All right, well, let's talk about something. First of all, I'm gonna do, this is the political season, so I figure it's okay to do an unplayed political announcement. So we're gonna start off, but I want you, I want you to uh, come back to our table sometime the, the, in the next hour or two and talk to us about recovering from religion. If you've not heard about us before, Talk to Sarah, talk to me, talk to Jerry DeWitt if he's around here. And we've got several facilitators. Uh, Peggy's here. Raise your hand, Peggy. And we've got real live people that have been working on Recovering from Religion for literally years. And we at Recovering from Religion are bringing thousands of people into the free thought movement. People that were in church last year are now coming to religions, coming to uh, Recovering from Religion groups. So we want, you, we want to educate you on what we're all about. Not that you ever will run a meeting or even interested in that, but you can tell other people about it and help us. And uh, we have meetings all around the United States. We've got meetings in four different countries. And we started the Secular Therapist Project. If you're a psychologist or you want to be a psychologist or you know a good secular psychologist, I want you to contact me because that's what we're looking for. I don't have time to go into that anymore today, though. So go to our table, learn about RR. Talk to Sarah, learn about how we're helping the, the clergy project. We're very involved in helping the clergy who are coming out of the clergy, uh, who are graduating from the clergy project or want to. And uh, learn how to start a group in your own community if that's something you're interested in. And uh, also learn how to help us be uh, stronger and, and how you can help support us. And perhaps we would love to get some donations. We're now a 501c3. We're a legitimate organization that can accept donations. Tax, tax deductible. And you can find us at uh, recoveringfromreligion.org. Hey, how many of you saw the new Richard Dawkins documentary? Oh, only a two or three of you. Gosh, you guys got to get online. Don't you guys ever go online? Go online. <laughs> look up sex, death, sex, God, and sex, God, sex, death, and God. I got the wrong title up there. Sex, death, and God and the meaning of life. Uh, Dawkins has a new documentary out. It's uh, like three different hours. And how many of you are here for me at my talk last year on the sex survey? All right, good. I'm in Dawkins' documentary. So you can see what I talked about. Of course, I only got three minutes, but it was a cool three minutes to be in, docu be in that documentary. And I will say that David Smalley's helped us get uh, the God Virus out, an audio book. It'll come out in about a week. Where's David? Thanks, David, wherever you are. All right, so today I'm going to talk about shame, the shame of believing, or why the hell do we act like Christians? This photograph, I, I don't know who took this photograph, but whoever you were, please come tell me if you were the person. This photograph was taken right here last year. Oh, cool. I had no idea. I love you. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had no idea somebody had taken that photograph, but it's so perfectly framed. Can you, isn't that? How many of you masturbate? I do. All right. Good job. Good job. Can you imagine asking that question in a Christian church? How about asking it in a Catholic or a uh, Muslim mosque? No, or a Mormon church. Do you think, do you think Mitt Romney actually masturbates? He was a bishop. Bishops have to tell 12-year-old boys not to tamper with the factory. That's, that's the... Uh, that's the uh, you know, the euphemism they use in the Mormon church for masturbation. I actually write about that uh, in a chapter on don't tamper with the factory and sex and God. So what we know is that religionists live a lie. They lie a, uh, live a lie of sexual shame. They're ashamed that they had premarital sex when they know darn good and well they weren't supposed to. They're ashamed that they masturbate and then know they're not supposed to. They're ashamed that they use pornography. They're ashamed uh, that they've done sex acts that disgust them. They tried doggy style one time. <laughs> They're ashamed to tell the truth about, about their own sex life to their children. They live a big lie. They lie to themselves and to others about their sexual behavior. It almost is by definition, if you are a Christian, you are lying about your sex life. Pretend that they pretend that they don't do what we know everybody on the planet does. It's like 
they can't act like real human beings. They preach against the very behavior that they do themselves. And, you know, we see a lot of that when the local minister gets caught in the bathroom with some other guy sometimes, you know, or messing with a prostitute somewhere. And they lie to their children about their behavior. How do we know all this? Well, we know it because they engage all the research going back to the 19, almost some clear back to the 1930s, most to the 1950s, shows that they engage in the same activities, sexual activities, as we secularists do. They start sex at the same time. They begin masturbating at the same time. And, uh, they give children, and they give their children false information about the sex life, about the sex that they have or that other people are having. And the evidence is that religionists have higher levels of sexually transmitted infections. If you just look at a map, uh, like a recent political map, look at the red states. Those are where you can get, you know, you can get diseases in those places. <laughs> and by the way, Missouri's in those places, so... Don't be fucking around here at Skepticon. <laughs> they, they use porn at least as much as we do. Uh, what's the highest porn use in the whole uh, state, in the whole nation? Utah, right. And what's number two? Mississippi. Yeah, somebody back there read my book, I guess. All right. They get divorced as much or more, generally more than uh, atheists. Uh, religious people get divorced as much as anybody else in the state they're in. So if they're in a high divorce state, they're also getting high, high divorces. And they have abortions higher than secularists do. There's more abortions among religionists than among secularists. Now, I talked about this last year, so I'm not going to go into great detail, or I'm not going into any detail about that. But the evidence is just overwhelming that religionists aren't doing what they say they're doing. And in fact, we are probably better at doing what they say to do than they are themselves in some rather interesting and, and good ways. So because of their shame, religionists can't evaluate their own behavior. They have no way to check it. I mean, if you're living in a delusion, you're not going to be able to evaluate that delusion very well. You have dif they have difficulty channeling their own sexual drives and urges. And they experience self-loathing and fear of their own natural urges. They can't stand themselves when they're in the bedroom. And we're in the red bedroom, by the way, a married couple who's Christian is always having a threesome with Jesus. <laughs> they lie to their spouse about their sexual activity. I know so many Christians who had sex before marriage, but swear up and down to their spouse that they were a virgin when they got married. I know people who tell their children don't have sex before marriage who themselves had multiple partners before they got married, but they tell their children they didn't. So they're lying to the children. The basis of, their, the basis of their marriage is a lie. The basis of their relationship with their children is a lie. They express sexual frustration, they express anger, and they do it through blaming and judging of other people. And very specifically, homosexual people. Yeah. Yes, right. And here's Daryl Ray's theory. You heard it first right here. I believe the root of homophobia in most of the planet, and that includes Hinduism, includes Islam, is, is rooted in the masturbatory behavior of the person themselves. So a religionist who hates homosexuals is scared shitless of his own masturbatory behavior. That's the root of homophobia. And I've got... Uh, that's my theory. I'd like somebody to test it. I don't know how we test it, but we're starting to get some good information about the more homophobic you are, the more you're probably homosexual under, underneath the surface. Anybody seen that research lately on the... Yeah, okay, so a lot of you have seen that research. And here's my evidence. Here's some of the best evidence. This comes from Mark Driscoll, the megachurch minister up there in Seattle. He says, masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it's a sex act that does not involve a woman. Ladies, you're getting off free on this one, okay? <laughs> if a man were to masturbate while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in a homosexual way. However, any man who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual activity, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror <laughs> and being turned on by his own male body. What the fuck? I never thought of that. So right after I saw this, I got in the bathroom and I started seeing if it works. <laughs> it doesn't work too well for me. All right. So religious sexuality is a one-size-fits-all. Everybody should fit into a 
very rigid sexual box. And it's an unnatural box. It's a box that we cannot and will not stay in as human beings. And the primary reason for that box that religion wants to put you in is because they know you can't stay in the box. When you step outside the box, you will be shamed. And shame is a very important component of religious indoctrination, of religious brainwashing. So let's look at what's going on really here. There are probably 10,000 sex acts for every live birth. But religionists tell us sex should be for procreation, especially our dear friend, the Pope. Pope says, have sex only for procreation. Well, this is my dear dog, Sugar. Many of you have been to my house, no sugar. sugar we have a rule, uh, I can't have any dogs up here unless, unless she's at least one of those dogs. So the Pope says, have sex only for procreation. Well, that's how my dog has sex. That's how an insect has sex. That's how a cow has sex. Most of the species on this sexual species on the planet only have sex when the female is fertile and ready to, uh, ready to reproduce. We're not like that. We can have sex any damn time we want to. And that's wonderful. I'm sure glad about that. But the Pope says, no, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing it. Now, when I say 10,000 sex acts, I'm including masturbation, guys and gals, okay? So we'll just put that in the equation. Although some of you might be doing 10,000 without masturbation. I don't know. Shame, fear, and guilt. It is always to a religion's advantage to create shame around sexual activity. And in the God virus, I talk about the guilt cycle. I won't go into detail about that either today. But the fact is, if I can make you feel guilty about something that you're going to do anyway, then the only place you can get forgiveness for that guilt is the place you learned it. So religion basically gives us the disease and then sells us a cure for that same disease. So without sexual guilt, without sexual fear, without sexual shame, all the major religions on the planet would collapse. Can you imagine the Pope waking up one day and saying, whoa, I had a great wet dream last night. I, I think we'll make masturbation legal. No, that's probably not going to happen. It has infected our political system, this whole idea of shame. Uh, I, and I've, I've got a ton of things I'd love to say about shame. Um, uh, but we, of course, if I had 10 hours, I would do it today. But look at this. See what's happened even in our own political system just in the late uh, last uh, few years. This fellow never masturbates. He never had sex outside of marriage. He, his wife had an abortion, but you can't. He, he wants you to catch his Catholic sexually transmitted infection. That's one fucked up dude, I think. <laughs> and then we've got our friend Rush Limbaugh, who thinks he can shame women into shutting their mouths and being quiet, not just in church, but in the entire political system. Sandra Fluke is one of my Pluck, I think, say, I can't remember. I think that's the way you pronounce her name. She is one of my heroes. She stood up. She stood up to Rush Limbaugh and told the guy to go fuck himself. And I love it. I think that's what more people ought to be doing. But why is Rush doing it? Because patriarchal religious systems use shame to keep women under control. And Rush is simply doing what patriarchies have been doing for about three or 4,000 years using sexual shame to keep women from asserting themselves physically, politically, spiritually, sexually, well, you know, whatever you want to call it. But there's one piece of shame that I don't hear anybody talking about. And I do want to spend a little bit of time on that piece of shame, and that is male shame. It's very obvious Rush Limbaugh is trying to shame uh, Sandra Fluck. What is not so obvious is what's going on inside of Rush Limbaugh's head, or indeed many, many males' heads. Shame is an important component in any religion, but one of the key parts of shame is telling men, you must control your wives and daughters. Men who don't control their wives and daughters are uh, not performing their duties as the head of the religious household, as the leader of whatever the religious... And that's what you see in Mitt Romney. That's what you see in Mormons. That's what you see in the Jehovah's Witnesses. You name the religion, and if it's patriarchal, and almost all of them are, the man is supposed to make sure he controls his wife and his daughters. Now, what happens if his daughter gets pregnant? Out of, quote, out of wedlock. That brings shame down upon the man. In some cultures, the daughter will be killed. 
In our culture, it will bring great shame on the family and you'll see fathers apologizing. I have heard atheist fathers, fathers apologize for their daughters getting uh, pregnant without being married. Now, what is going on there? Why would an atheist father ever apologize unless he's infected with this notion of shame? And there's also the notion of shame around masturbation. Religion wants to shame males into not masturbating, even though we know they will, so that means they have to come back to church and get forgiveness. Women are never mentioned in the Bible. You're not to, there's nobody says a woman can't masturbate in the Bible. But supposedly, and there's some questionable verses even in the Bible about males, but supposedly males aren't supposed to masturbate either. But when I was growing up as a 13-year-old in the locker room of, of my middle school or, or middle, um, junior high, there was always somebody getting made fun of. You know, if you shake it more than three times, you're playing with it. You're going to be a homo if you do that. That's, I've heard that so many times. How many of you have heard that, guys? Yeah, okay. I don't care if you're an atheist or not. Even if you're a 13-year-old atheist in the locker room, you are going to get infected with ideas of shame around your own body, around your own masturbatory activity. You're going to get that signal. And where does that signal come from? It comes from religion. Shame in the locker room, I think, is a powerful component of religious indoctrination. And, and uh, it, you know, it's everywhere. As you saw, I don't know if you could see it from my perspective, virtually every man in this room raised his hand just now. So the religion gives you the disease, then gives you the cure for the disease. Just come confess to the priest. Just come read your Bible. Come to Bible study. Come to Sunday school. You can get forgiveness for masturbating, for having sex outside of marriage, for thinking, looking in a playboy, or lusting after someone. So you can take religion out of sex, but you can't take sex out of religion. That's the, comp that's the key component I want you to remember here today. If we took sex out of religion, almost all the religions on the planet would collapse. So sex, to me, is the most important thing for us to attack. And I'm on a roll right here in this, in this sense. I think you can go out and debate. And I, I love watching Matt Delahunty debate, by the way. The guy's amazing. I've been too close to him too many times and just felt like an idiot when I'm close to him, you know, watching him debate people. But you can debate all day about whether God exists or not but you're really not necessarily hitting them where it really hurts. Where it really hurts is their sexuality, and I'm going to demonstrate that here in a minute. And you might be saying, well, Daryl, why are you talking about this? I'm not even religious. Well, we are swimming in a polluted culture, a religiously polluted culture. And I think there are many secularists, many right here in this room, that are still infected with religious ideas. And let's figure that out. If you experience guilt or shame around your own sexuality, that tells me you're probably still infected with religion. Uh, I, uh, I told somebody last week, I was in a, you know, just uh, in a coffee shop, and somebody was there with me, a bunch of other atheists, and this new person was there. And I said, uh, somebody had told him, oh, he's written a new book. Well, what's your book about? So I, I tell this person, Sex and God. Their face gets red instantly. Bulge comes up here, they turn around, they ca almost can't control themselves. And I say, well, what's going on with that guy? <laughs> Ask one of his friends. I don't know. So about five minutes later, the guy, the guy comes back, he sits down, and he says, I, I can't believe you've written a book about sex and God. That I, I was told never to talk about sex in public, and, and so I, I don't think I want to read that book. That was amazing to me. This is an atheist, and he's not been, a, I mean, he's been an atheist like four or five years. Why would he have such a powerful response to that simple? It was just the title of the book. I'm not asking him to read it. All right. So we act like Christians when we hide our sexuality, when we pretend like we don't or haven't done something, when we pretend to our, ch pretend to our children like we didn't have premarital sex, or we pretend to our spouse, our spouse that we don't masturbate. My mother caught me masturbating when I was 13 years old in my bedroom. God, that was embarrassing. Wow. But my mother sat down. She was very kind to me. She says, well, Daryl, it's okay. You can do it. You, you'll stop doing it when you get married. <laughs> and she was the most open-minded person about I, 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 I knew at that time. So, and I did. I never masturbated after I got married. Not, <laughs> at least not for three days. <laughs> so... We act like Christians when we let religionists condemn perfectly legal sexual behavior. 
and when we don't challenge them on that behavior. And we act like religionists when we act ashamed of our sexuality. Like, for instance, when we walk into a porn store. If you walk into a porn store, if you get a twinge of guilt or shame, that's religion speaking there, folks. There's no shame in porn. Now, in Missouri, right here in our wonderful, great state of Missouri, if you want to find a porn shop, don't look for the porn shop advertisement. Watch for the religious advertisement. This is a $3,000 a month billboard. And the guy that owns the porn shop is probably praying for this billboard to come up in front of his porn shop. It's advertising far better. I mean, that's a pretty lousy advertisement right there compared to this. I haven't noticed any porn shops going out of uh, business on I-70 between Kansas City and St. Louis. Even with the internet, they still seem to be thriving. So, <coughs> excuse me, let me illustrate this to you. You know, Jeff, you know, Jeff Foxworthy, <laughs> you might be a redneck if, well, let's talk about it in this way. You might be a Christian secularist or a Christian atheist if you feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel shame admitting you enjoy porn. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sexuality. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your spouse or your partner about sexual fantasies you would like to have. Now, let me repeat that. You are a Christian atheist if you can't even talk to the most important sex partner you've got in your life, the most important uh, emotional partner you've got in your life about fantasies that are perfectly normal and perfectly legitimate. And I have a lot of examples in the atheist community of people say, I could not possibly talk to my husband about spanking me once in a while. I could not talk to my wife about tying me up and teasing me. They just, it's just like, wow, you can't do that? And you're an atheist. Where is this coming from? It's coming from religious infection that you have not gotten rid of in your own self. So you might be a uh, Christian atheist if you, if you feel guilty about masturbating. Oh, wait, I, I just looked at that one. Uh, <laughs> So Christ, religion's weak spot, I think, is sexuality. It's not whether God exists or not. That's, that's not the weak spot of religion. You can debate all day long. But you can challenge people on their sexuality and on their sexual behavior. So don't let religionists dictate to us what we can and can't talk about. I, I want to talk openly about myself, about my sexuality. And I, I'm not saying go out and, you know, be inappropriate and and, you know, expose yourself or anything stupid like that, but within, within reasonable bounds, but be open about it. Don't let them kowtow us into, into, a, into behaving in their shameful way. I think we should follow the lead of the gay community. I think the gays have done more to, to challenge religionists in the United States than we heard earlier. Yeah. We heard that earlier today, how, how, much, how much power the uh, gay, gay movement has had in challenging religion. Well, we ought to be there helping them. Let's help challenge the religionists with our own sexuality. I'm not gay, but I support gays. I support them in any way I possibly can. And I'm going to act like a gay person in the sense that I'm not going to be ashamed of who I am or, or who I, what I believe is for me, sexually right for me. I don't push my sexuality on other people. I don't believe what is right for me is necessarily right for you, but I also don't believe you have a right to impose your sexuality, your sexual taboos, your sexual shame and guilt on me. So here's the, here's the thing. Be out about your sexuality and respect and support others in their sexual choices and sexual preferences. It's the biggest challenge we can do about religion. I am not a Christian, and I don't have to act like one. <laughs> so uh, I put the fig leaf in for the 13 year old I don't know where they are but I just so I didn't have to put that third <laughs> so yes let's not act like Christians let's be out and open about ourselves and here's examples 
I could say, sure, I fornicate, just like a lot of religious people do. Sure, I masturbate. Don't you? I mean, it's a simple question, but it's an admission that I am a normal human being, and I'm damn sure I'm not going to lie about that. And I'm not going to let you get away with lying about it either. So if you say, yes, sure, I masturbate. Don't you? Two things, one of two things is going to happen. They'll say, oh, yeah, I do too. Or they're going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> 90, as, as Albert Ellis, I studied with the great psychotherapist Albert Ellis, he, uh, he had a famous saying, he said, 97% of all men admit to masturbating and the other 3% are lying. <laughs> about 80% of women masturbate, and I don't know if the other 20% are lying or not, but some of them are, I'm positive of that. So, you, I, and I, you know, people say, well, you sure talk about masturbation a lot, Daryl. Yeah, you know, that's the most important part of your sex life. Because you're always, you're always making love to yourself. And your self is always around to make love too. So it is a pretty important component of your sexual activity, of your sex life. And if you're not enjoying it, I feel sorry for you. There's a lot of enjoyment to go on there. Sure, I like pornography, just like most religious people. They just can't admit it. We should be framing their behavior. And here's the way we frame it. Control of women's bodies is the key component of all patriarchal religions. If you don't control your women's bodies, and that includes your, it could include your mother in Saudi Arabia, 12-year-old boys can escort their mothers. Isn't that, that's amazing. Uh, controlling your wife, controlling your daughters. But it's males controlling women's bodies is the key component of all patriarchal religions. And we need to challenge that. Uh, and we need to frame it in ways that, that just put it right back in their face. And here's one way to do it. A woman might say... I take birth control because I like sex inside or outside of marriage, just like Newt Gingrich and Les Rush Limbaugh do. I mean, how many wives and how many lovers have these two guys had and they're telling you, you have to be married in order to do it? That's crazy. I mean, this guy, his own staff ha had to get him out of cars fucking women while he was running for Congress. This was back 20, 25 years ago. And they complained about it. He always had a new lover. Yeah, he's had three wives or four wives. How many wives has Newt had now? Three, three wives, yeah. But he's had 50 other lovers. I'm quite sure of that at, at minimum, probably. And who knows about Rush Limbaugh? He may be gay. All right. So be out. Hell no. <laughs> I wouldn't take him either. <laughs> but I don't want him in the whole hetero world. <laughs> So be out about your sexuality, be tactful, be, you know, be cognizant of your job and other responsibilities you've got in life. I'm not saying come out and get fired, uh, but be, uh, be as out as you possibly can. If you are a practicing nudist, for example, there is no reason to be ashamed of that. When I was growing up, my parents thought, that about five doors down, they thought the couple who had no children were nudists. And they would, they would whisper about, oh, those people are nudists. And, and if they were, I don't know if the people were nudists or not, but they sure didn't advertise it. They never said a word about it. You'd be at neighborhood parties and stuff. They would never whisper. But, you know, being a nudist is no better or worse than belonging to the Elks, Elks Club. It's, it's perfectly legal, legitimate behavior. There's no reason to be ashamed of it. If you're kinky, be not ashamed. If... <laughs> If you're polyamorous, advertise it. Put it out there. Let people know you're a polyamorous. If you're anything sexual, be as open and reasonable as reasonably possible. And don't let the religion, religionists kowtow us into abiding by their shame-based behavior. In casual conversation, you can say something like this. Sure, I talk to my children about masturbation and birth control. I told them how normal it is and not to listen to other children if they say their religion says it's wrong. Imagine telling a Christian parent that little sentence right there. Wow, that is a powerful challenge to them, their sexuality, and the sex education methods they're using with their own children. Because chances are the person you're talking to masturbated that same day, or certainly within the last week. And you're saying, they're telling their children not to. And you're saying, I am not a hypocrite. That's what you're really saying. I am not a hypocrite. How about you, Mr. or Mrs. Religionist? 
<laughs> in a conversation, you can say, my husband and I have been in an open relationship for 20 years. We enjoy it a lot. It's made our marriage stronger. We love each other wonderfully. And we enjoy our outside partners as well. I met a 70-plus-year-old couple in Arizona a few years ago after I did a talk like this. And they came up to me and they said, we can't say enough how glad we are to hear people talking about this. We have been out about our nudity and about, about our uh, open sexual relationship. And we've had an open relationship since the day we got married at, I think they said 28 years old they got married. They had an open relationship. And they'd been married for what, 50 years? And they're open and proud about it now. Of course, they weren't most of their lives, but they're starting to come out now. So I am not a Christian, and I'm not bound by Christian rules, sex, and sexuality. I don't have to pretend to follow their rules, and I want to quietly, very persistently, challenge their guilt-based, their shame-based religion by simply being who I am. Whoever Daryl is, that's who I'm going to be. And that's what I... That's what I challenge you to go back and find out how can you be who you are. Start asking questions. Why do I cower when I'm around that person? Why do I avoid certain topics around that person? Why do I act ashamed around my body? How do I, why do I not use certain words? And again, I'm not encouraging you to be vulgar. I mean, I'm vulgar in here, but we're all friends here, right? But I'm challenging you to be appropriate, but don't kowtow to the, to the uh, shame. If someone is racist in front of me, I will challenge that. That pisses me off. If someone is sexist, I will challenge them about that. That pisses me off. If someone is sex negative, that pisses me off. I will challenge that just as much. And so we should let people know that we are sex positive and we're going to stand for that view of life and we're going to champion that view of life for everybody around us. If we, if we see people being persecuted because of their sexual preferences or talked down about or in some way slandered, we have to stand up just as, just as we stood up and most of us did during, during the civil rights era and we challenged racism and look what we've been able to achieve. It's not gone. I'm not saying the society is not racist. We could see that by the last election. But there certainly is a lot less in key areas. Let's, uh, let's let go of things like shame. Shame in our own body. Now, I want to give you a newsflash here. It's the only body you're going to get. There's not a second resurrection. There's not a, there's not a, a new body you're going to get after death. So it doesn't matter what body you've got right now. It's the only one you're going to get. Get over the shame. Get over the guilt about your own body. Learn to live with your body. Be proud of your body. Treat your body right and enjoy your body. It's, it's just, it's built, it's built for pleasure. It's built for enjoyment. Don't judge other people by their bodies. P other people, you, what you, when you judge other people by their bodies, you are saying a hell of a lot about yourself. Just like someone who judges somebody else based on the color of their skin is really saying a whole lot about themselves. Uh, and, and get over your own guilt about, and, about your own desires and fantasies. You know, if you want your husband to tie you up and spank you once in a while, there's nothing to be ashamed about that. Guys, if you want your wife to tie you up, or guys, you know, I don't care which way you swing, just, make, just tell them, talk openly about it. When I wrote Sex and God, one of the key parts of the book was the last five chapters. Those five chapters are written to challenge every one of you to have a very strong, deep conversation about your sex, your sexual preferences, your sexuality, with whoever your partner is. I want us to start becoming better communicators with our partners about our sexuality. That will make us more comfortable with ourselves and we'll leave, go out into the bigger world and challenge the bigger world. If you're comfortable in yourself, you're gonna be comfortable outside challenging people. So let's go on the offensive. And let's do things like what Maryam Namazi did with the big calendar. I think I flipped this up here last year. I'm not gonna do that this year. But uh, when she put that calendar out with, with all the uh, different uh, major players in the, in the feminist atheist community, she weighs, raised some waves and it made, some, it made a big difference. Let's ask some embarrassing questions. Does your priest or preacher masturbate, do you think? You know, that guy that was debating out there, 
I wanted to go up here and ask him that question last night, but too many other people were there. I didn't want to interrupt it. But I went in the worst way to ask him, I masturbated today, did you? That's, that's all I wanted to ask. He's a Christian. He's, he's there trying to talk about God and all this. But his children are right there, and I didn't want to get, a, I didn't want to get accused of... Uh, what I was really doing, and that is trying to indoctrinate his children for him. <laughs> uh, do you think your priest or pre minister had premarital sex? I'm pretty darn sure most ministers I knew in Bible college had premarital sex. They were all over, too many women, too many times. Uh, are you honest? Uh, if I'm talking to a religionist, I might say, are you honest with your children about your sex life, about your sexual history? Uh, do you expect your children to do what you can't do yourself? I mean, these are questions we can openly and easily ask a religionist. And, and it really puts the onus on them to either lie or re-examine their assumptions as a religionist. Be honest with your own children. If you're an atheist, a secularist, tell your children you had several lovers before you got married. If you're polyamorous and you're married and you got children, let your children understand what that is. With age-appropriate information, obviously. There's, there's some things you don't want to tell real kids, young kids, because it might create other problems. And I'm not saying to do that. Uh, tell them, yeah, I started masturbating when I was 12 years old. Now, Eric down here, he started when he was 11, I think, right? Nine, nine, Eric, yeah. He was in my talk, I think, on American Atheists, and he, I said 12, and he said, 12? <laughs> yeah, right, so I, I'm, I'm a late bloomer, okay? Uh, so be, be and act comfortable in, in your own sexuality. If you act ashamed of your sexuality, your behavior will speak loud and clear to your children. Your children know if you're ashamed of your body. They know if you're ashamed of your sexual behavior and your sexuality and ashamed of your relationship with your partner. They, can, they sense this stuff. Challenge, and shame, the, challenge shame, challenge guilt in yourself. If you feel shame or guilt... It's generally based in some kind of religious programming. Your shame and guilt helps perpetuate the shame and guilt and sexual oppression of other people within your sphere of influence, including your spouse and including your children. Your inability to be open about your sexuality is a sign of your continued religious infection with a God virus. I wrote Sex and God to help people like you and I to get over the residual effects of religion. I don't care how long you've been an atheist. I had a lifelong atheist. The guy had been an atheist since he was 14 years old. Say, I need to have coffee with you. This happened about six months ago. He'd heard me talk. He'd read the, God, the sex and God. He came in for two hours. I sat in that coffee shop. I hardly said a word. All he had to say over and over again in so many different ways was I had no idea how infected I still was with shame and guilt around sexuality. And this is a man that, you know, from the outside, you'd say he's pretty comfortable with his sexuality. But obviously he wasn't, or he wouldn't have had that two-hour coffee conversation. One-way conversation, I really couldn't get a word in edgewise, hardly. So I want to start building a framework for us secularists, a framework that steps outside of the religious training and indoctrination. I want to celebrate positive, natural sexuality, not religious sexuality. There is Catholic sexuality. There's Baptist sexuality, there's Muslim, there's Hindu sexuality. None of those sexualities are related to human sexuality. Not one of them are. I want us to develop human sexuality for ourselves. I want to encourage seculars to be open and proud about our sexuality. We are, we are a unique, and we, I call us secular sexuals. And I would like to pro propagate that meme from this room throughout the world. Start considering ourselves secular sexuals. Think about that. I'm not a Catholic sexual and all that goes on with that. I'm not a Baptist sexual and all that goes on with that. I am a secular sexual. What does that mean? And that will, that will inform an entire universe of ethical considerations and reconsiderations in our behavior, I think. We are not tied to religious guilt, shame, guilt or shame like the Mormons, the Christians, the Muslims, the Hindus. So let's not act like them. I am a sex-positive atheist, and I'm proud of it. I am a secular sexual. So, sex is fun, and so is drinking. <laughs> Let's do them responsibly, all right? There's no Jesus to forgive you if you hurt somebody else. 
and there's no, I don't want you to be a vector for a sexually transmitted infection, and I don't want you to be a vector for a God virus either. And they're both sexually transmitted diseases, as you, as you well know in my, in my own uh, writings. So I would like to encourage you to visit our table out here, learn about, uh, learn about uh, recovering from religion, take a look at my two books that are out there right now, if you're interested in having me speak in one of your organizations or meetings, uh, you can find me through Recovering from Religion, through Secular Student Alliance uh, Speakers List, or from ipcpress.com. Any of those places will get, you, get me. So with that, I'm going to call it quits. And thanks a lot for your attention, folks. Thank you.